talk to Bill Nogueira, a death row prison inmate at San Quentin. Uh, he's been on death row for almost 40 years for a murder that he committed when he was 18. We're talking more about the Idaho murders and, and particularly the probable cause affidavit that was released. And if he sees anything in there, I mean, he can't read it, but he did um, be able to watch some of the stuff on TV unfold, see what he thinks about it. I, you know, ask him some questions, let him know, hey, you originally told me you thought the offender was in the house, um, but it appears that maybe that isn't true. You know, what do you think about that? And I try to get him to talk a little bit about physical exertion. And this is important. In the probable cause affidavit, you have the offender coming down and walking past a witness. Maybe he didn't see her. Maybe he was just so tired that there was no more fight in him. You know, he had just taken the lives of four innocent people. Bill has experienced this. So... What I mean is he didn't kill multiple people. He killed one person, but he did it through strangulation and through uh, blunt force trauma. It was a fight. Now, it was a fight against a female, um, but nonetheless, a fight where adrenaline is pumping. And he would know, hey... In that moment, when you left, would you be able to finish off a witness? Be, or would you be physically exerted to the point where you just let go? You just walk on by? I want to know. That's the beauty of talking to somebody that has committed the act of murder. Is to get that inside knowledge. So we can roll it in or roll it out. That's what we want to know, right? So I'll be talking to Bill about that and see what he has to say in regards to the probable cause affidavit released in the Idaho murders and the suspect, Brian Coburg. So I'm asked all the time, Detective Maines, what can I do to keep my stuff off the internet? All my personal information. Well, I don't like that stuff out there. I don't want people to know my voting preference. I don't want people to know my cell phone number. I don't want people to know my address. I'm a private person. I don't want that stuff out there for people to take advantage of me. That's why I use Data Seal. Okay? It personally is the comprehensive data removal service that I trust. So use the link below to receive 5% off of your Data Seal subscription and protect you and your family. If you have concerns that your personal information is being exposed online, use Data Seal. It's the one that I trust and I use personally. So listen guys, there's a link in the bio and in the comment sections. Click on that link and you'll get 5% off of your subscription. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Okay, we're back. Uh, we got Bill Nagara on the phone again. Uh, he's on death row at San Quentin. And we're going to talk a little bit this morning about the Idaho arrest and the release of the affidavit of probable cause. So, Bill, uh, you're aware of the uh, release of the uh, affidavit? I am, yes. What do, you, uh, what do you think of that? Anything come about that struck you? Well, yeah, there's a few things that struck me with a head, and I just thought, like, you got to be kidding me. Of course, they're only giving us enough for the probable cause, as you and I have discussed, and we know that they have a lot more. But what really just caught me by surprise is that there's been a lot made of this guy's intelligence. And I don't mean regular intelligence. I mean his knowledge of crime scenes, criminology, the, the criminal mind, the guy even had a study where he had criminals come in and discuss crimes with him. So you would think that the guy would have a bit of common sense. It doesn't seem that this guy has any common sense whatsoever because I've been in a cage for 40 years. And Ken, I watch television and I watch 
20, 20, and sometimes 48 hours. And the biggest thing in the last 10 years that pops up is that you have these pings off of cell phone towers. And we know that criminals should not take phones with them wherever they go when they're going to commit a crime. This guy has his phone with him. He is stalking the people, and they it, it's just so obvious this guy is just not the guy you think he is in terms of his intelligence and, and just the mistakes he made. And it's, yeah, so, you know, right off the bat, to me, it's a lesson learned that book smarts doesn't mean street smarts, number one. Um, and like Mike Tyson used to say, you know, everybody has a plan till they get hit in the mouth. And that is no further from the truth or more of a better example of the truth than right here. He planned this. Obviously, he stalked those victims if his f phone was pinging uh, at least 12 different times at late at night, early morning, just like both of us had said that he was probably doing. So he's planning it. He's fantasizing, thinking about what he's going to do, has it all meticulously laid out, and then goes in there and gets hit in the mouth and everything changes. That's how I see it. Yeah, it, absolutely. And, and, you know, I don't know because I don't think like most normal people or the audience does, but when I'm watching a television series or I'm watching a 48 hours on a particular crime, as the, 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 the scene unfolds, I'm thinking of ways of how I would have done it. Like, this is something I've done since for a very long time, obviously. And when I see this, I think, well, he wasn't doing that. Because it doesn't matter that he walked in and he got punched in the mouth. Carrying extra stuff like this, the, the knife sheath with him, why would you carry that? That makes no sense unless he wasn't experienced and he had it in his hand and he felt he might cut himself. So he had it in the sheet. So he takes it out and he drops it. That's a huge mistake. The phone's a mistake. It's just so many mistakes back and forth that this guy made that it's obvious book smarts does not make a criminal and I'll take it further book smarts does not make an investigator or a profiler you can't read books and know this stuff I agree so what do you uh, what's your opinion on the uh, at least 12 different occasions where his phone pinged by that house at, at you know like 2 or 3 in the morning this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded at times when, you know, they are probably in bed, uh, more than likely. Yeah, look, he obviously stalked his victims. He, he knew who he wanted. We don't know who that particular person is. Why did he kill four instead of six? Uh, there, there is a, a method to his madness. We just don't know what it is yet. But it's obvious. He stalked. He fantasized. He has all the makings and the markings of an organized killer. This wasn't, he happened by this house, saw a Christmas light and went in. This wasn't by chance. He planned it, he fantasized, he stalked, he struck. It's, that is the classic mode of an organized killer, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, made a lot of mistakes, but you could tell he was cruising that area, just stalking them. What what do you make of in the affidavit that one of the surviving roommates actually saw him and he walked right by her and exited out the sliding glass door and apparently you know, we we there's more to the story but she went back in her room locked the door kind of was like frozen in fear when he walked by her why wouldn't he kill her Thing that pops up, he, he didn't see her. Number one, I mean that, that would be my assumption that he was, uh, you know, ready to leave. He was spooked, possibly. But if a killer is seen, or maybe he was confident that the, the disguise that he had would have ultimately uh, not led to a physical description that was telling enough to arrest him. However. It, and this is me going out on a limb here, because I don't know, and I would hate to have been in, in, in the victim's shoes or 
the surviving victims, because we don't know what the, the, the human mind does when it gets scared. Anything can happen. And I really have a problem with sometimes when law enforcement say, well, it's impossible. The person was in fear, and they hit into the bed, and they didn't come out for five hours, and therefore they must be involved. That really ticks me off because, or when someone says, well, the person was crying, but they weren't really crying enough to make it look like they were innocent. I don't buy that stuff. Everybody responds to different situations differently. Like you said, Mike Tyson said it, everybody's got a plan until they get in the mouth. And when you're in that situation, you don't know how you're gonna respond. Now that being said, I do have a problem with that. And I'll tell you why. A young woman sees this perpetrator and he walks past her out the glass door and leaves. Great. However, why would she be scared? She was not part of the incident. She didn't see the incident. She wasn't aware of what happened in those rooms. So she couldn't be frozen because she didn't know what happened. It could have been a burglar. And your first reaction then is to call the police. He's left the building. He's no longer there. Find out what happened. So that strikes me a little weird. It's not impossible, but that strikes me weird. Right. I mean, she doesn't know that you know, a quadruple homicide just happened. She may just think, hey, it's an ex-boyfriend stalking. It's a college party house. It's not like it's unusual to have somebody there at 3 in the morning. Now, him all dressed in black certainly would raise a red flag to me and you. Uh, but maybe she just thought, you know, it was a fraternity prank or whatever and didn't think anything of it. And went back in her room, locked the door because she doesn't want anybody coming in and went back to sleep. I don't know. Yeah, I was struck that, that kids at this age, the first thing they do would be they text a friend or text their buddies upstairs and everything okay. I think that's not how I would do it. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm thinking almost like an experienced criminal. So that would be my response. I'm also male and aggressive where she is a young lady and has a different state of mind. Now, the other possibility, and this is, I mean, this is not to say that this is the truth. These are just possibilities I'm throwing out there, Candy, is that she imagined it. Mm -hmm. After the trauma of seeing what happened to her friends, she began to think about it, and it almost, like in a dream state, thought, look, I opened the door, I saw the guy, and it really didn't happen. That's a possibility. Sure. But again, go ahead. No, sure, you're right. And, and of course, we don't know the rest of the affidavit. It, it's very limited. They're only going to give us so much because they want to know what the defense is going to do. They're not going to put all their eggs in one basket. Maybe there's more. Maybe he tried to get into the room. Maybe she locked it. Maybe he did something at the door that caused her to close the door and freeze in fear. We don't know this because, again, it wasn't necessary for the probable cause affidavit to be filed. And so we're playing a guessing game here, but these are the different circumstances I see as possibilities. When, let me ask you this question. Um... And I'm going to ask you it because you've had experience with this in regards to your own case and the reason that you're there. Could it be that the reason he didn't kill her if he saw her is because of physical exertion, the adrenaline dump of what had just occurred? That's, that's possible, not probable. Okay, tell me why. The adre okay, the adrenaline in the body of a person exerting himself at that level, it's an extreme. We're talking about a person who's taking you know, the flight, the fight or fright, or flight thing, where an animal, because we are animals, has taken something to an extreme. You don't, your levels of adrenaline don't drop that quickly. And I'm not referring to any crime I may have committed or have committed, and I'll tell you why. During these type of situations, and I'm talking about in the ring, fighting, you don't lose that adrenaline level when you've released it because you're releasing chemicals into the brain. Now, dopamine, uh, testosterone, he's very young, and he's at the peak of his testosterone level. His adrenaline did not drop. It didn't drop till he got to wherever he was going at home, and he rested. In that mode where he is still the stalker, the killer, the perpetrator, the predator, his levels have not dropped. I don't buy that. I mean, again, I'm guessing here, but I'm saying because I've spent time in the ring, I have fought, and I know what it feels like. You don't 
that doesn't, adrenaline doesn't drop, your temper doesn't drop until it's over completely and you're gone. So you're saying with him walking out the door and seeing her, just because of the physical exertion that he just went through, um, it wouldn't have mattered. That wouldn't have played into it at all, in your this opinion. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. In your opinion. It wouldn't have played into it. Okay. In my opinion, it wouldn't have played into it. Actually, it would have excited him. Okay. And, and let me give you an example. You've seen that deer sometimes, you know, very young deer, when a cheetah or a leopard jumps on them and it doesn't fight back, it loses interest right away. But as soon as it takes off running again, that predator engages. With seeing the girl, he would immediately see another victim, a potential victim. His adrenaline would have spiked again. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that he was too exhausted. I, honestly, and again, I'm, I'm guessing here, I don't believe he saw her. And, and if that's true, it's a possibility that she may have imagined what she saw. Not that that's true. I'm just giving you possibilities here. Right. Well, let's talk quickly about the knife. You have 60 seconds remaining. Well, before uh, we get into, I want to talk about the knife sheath being laid there and the implications that come about that if you call me back. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Bye. All right. So what about this knife sheath that has obviously was in the probable cause? What stands out to me is the location of it. I think we can maybe uh, learn something from that. And also the DNA that was found on that. I'll give you my opinions on it after I hear what you have to say. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I heard, and again, I could be wrong, that the knife sheet was found near the bed or under the bed. Is that correct? It was on the bed next to Maddie. Well, the two girls were, okay. were in one bed, but it was on top of the bed next to one of the bodies. Okay. So, you know, as I said before, it shows a bit of precaution, a bit, a bit of inexperience, that he wasn't um, experienced enough with a knife to have it out already and ready. So he obviously enters the room and pulls probably what I see, the knife being in his pocket. He pulls it out. He's afraid it'll cut him by it being in his pocket, so it's in his sheath. He pulls it out. He unsheaths it which tells me the girl, the girls were asleep. And he probably just, because he was so focused on what he was doing, which was the, the action of stabbing and killing, that he just subconsciously released the, the, the sheath in order to grab with his weaker hand, as I mentioned before, and with his dominant hand, stab. Right. That's probably the easiest and simplest explanation for why that sheath is there. So, well, can we then hypothesize that they were the first ones killed? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what, you know, we had said all along is one of those two girls was the target. Now, I don't know. I guess we still don't know that. This doesn't tell you that. But it's another possible indicator that he knew where he was going and to whom he was going to kill. That is absolutely correct, yes. All right, let's talk about the DNA on the sheath. Now, um, my thing is, even if he was wearing gloves, which he may or may not have, if the roommate that saw him saw him with a, you know, a mask on of some sort, I'm sure that he did have gloves on. But that would not preclude his DNA getting on the snap of that sheath's when he first purchased it, let's say. He has to open it. Oh, sure. So his DNA, is, from touch DNA, is going to be on there. Yes, and I don't believe that he bought it stuck in a toolbox and didn't pull it out until that night. Usually, perps, perpetrators, killers, they play with the instrument that they are going to use. I'm sure that he, on a number of occasions, in his room, in his bathroom, had the knife in him, on him, uh, pulled it out, unsnapped it, made the motions as if he were stabbing somebody. He wanted to get a feel of the instrument to get a familiar, uh, to familiarize himself with it. So I believe that it didn't come from that knife. It more probably happened during the 
hours or days and weeks prior to the incident that he played with it. And whether it was brand new or not, only the police and law enforcement know this, but normally these type of guys have something that's very personal to them. It's a night that they've had for a while. I'm leaning towards that this was not a personal uh, item that he really cared about much because, as I said before, he just probably could he study this stuff, obviously not very well, that he maybe did other incidents with different instruments. This was just the instrument this time. But once he used it, it became very uh, significant to him. And that's why I believe we haven't found that. And the, the sheave was not part of the weapon. It wasn't important to him. And that's why subconsciously just laid it down. What was important was that knife. And he took it with him. Where it's at, if anybody's opinion, uh, uh, guess. But I believe it's somewhere close to him or was close to him where he had access to it so he can go back to it. All right. Well, one of the things that I think we can rule out now after reading that affidavit is that he was waiting inside the house. Now, do you agree with that or not because of the them seeing the Elantra, his car, outside around, what was it, 3.16 a.m. or something like that, and they believe the murders happened between 4 and 4.30 a.m. Unless he was only in there for a short amount of time, but they would have been home already. Uh, so we would have to rethink how he gained entry um, am i right in assuming yes. that so yes, now that you well, I have a, go ahead now that you know about the affidavit does that change your thought on that at all well it does that only that i have not read the affidavit i've only listened to what's been um shown on television and national news um and they're they're giving us different reports i had not seen that the car was seeing at this time I, I, as you know a detective mostly does, would do i don't want to know who saw the car interview that person was it really that car a lot of people as you know like to say things that did not exist and it throws law enforcement for a loop because someone tells you they saw the car at 316 and in fact that never happened the person just wanted to become a part of the investigation by mentioning oh yeah well, i saw this well so I, I don't know if it's camera footage yeah it is. I think it's all uh, door cam footage and, and so on and so forth. Piecing that together, seeing when he actually got to the area and parked and matched that up with the activity on his phone and then seeing him leave the area in that car again around 430, 427, something in that area. It was a very tight window, you know, around 4 a.m. to 427 you know, AM. And a lot of people think that, that a murder of four people can't happen. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. That a murder can't happen within, what, that 20-minute gap. Well, how do you feel about that? Oh, I get oh yeah, that's absolutely inaccurate. Right. That homicide that took place with four kids, technically, it could have happened in less than five minutes. It could have happened in four minutes. Yes, I, I agree. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just can't see him, you know, doing one. Just think about this. If you count out loud 30 seconds, that's a long time. And if you are stabbing, it takes probably less than 11 seconds per person and he has to walk downstairs to another level, enter, maybe he waited a few moments to see if anybody had heard, if anybody was gonna come out. I believe that Ethan was found outside the bedroom. Maybe he did come out and he ambushed them there and then went into the room. That only takes seconds. Right. It, it, this whole thing could happen in less than five minutes. Um, but yes, you, so now we know that there is video kind of him in the car, which tells me that, okay, he was not in the house. I mean, this was an educated guess. I figured the dog didn't bark. He had to gain access, which now tells me, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, it tells both of us that he had a very good sense of that house. He knew how to get into the house, and he knew how to leave the house, which gives us the impression that he knew that house somehow. 
the stalking he had done, he probably went to the house a couple of times, tried to get in or got in, or he left the door open like I mentioned that the Golden State Killer had done. He would go in in the daytime when the kids are probably at school, he would open the door, he familiarized himself with the rooms, because in the dark it's very hard to maneuver on a house you don't recognize, you're not familiar with. Right. That tells me he, he and that's why I thought he was probably also in the house for that reason, that he knew how to maneuver around the house, he knew where the other kids were, and he struck the bedroom upstairs first, then came downstairs, struck that room. Um, yeah, it tells me that he was familiar with it. Right. Well, he has no other reason to be going near that house on at least 12 different occasions at 3 in the morning other than to familiarize himself with that layout and the people there, is, is my guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the first time, I don't know how many times, he said it was around 12 times. Yeah. I would say that the first nine times to 10 times were dry runs. He went there without any weapons, without anything. He probably wasn't dressed to do anything, but he was familiarizing himself with the area. It's like no different when a bank robber goes to the bank, he goes and he, he has a checking account, or he looks around and he leaves a couple times just to get familiarized with who's working there, who the tellers are, and to pick up cues and behavioral traits of the guards. Or the, I'm sorry, the... This, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So those times he went, the first couple of times he probably just drove by, or he parked and he looked. He probably used the woods in the back to watch, to see what the kids do. I'm sure the last two times, he probably went there with the the intention to possibly kill, but he didn't, it, the circumstances weren't right. It didn't feel right for him. Oh, yeah. that night he did. Right. Well, and it's a big risk in a way, too, because there was a DoorDash delivery to that house at 4 a.m. for Zaina. And it was paid for and everything. Now, you know, police are saying it happened between 4 and 4.30 a.m. Man, a DoorDash delivery was just there. Someone just delivered food to that, to that house, and yet he still strikes. Does that tell you anything that it didn't deter him? Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. Um, I, I obviously didn't know that, but I, look, I don't know. The 316, the cars there, maybe he was already in the house by that time. Sure, he could have been. Possible he was. Be because, uh, yeah. and I'll tell you something that might back that up, is that uh, in the affidavit, the surviving roommate heard who she thought was Kaylee say somebody's in the house. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's frightening to think about that. And look, I, I'm a guy with 40 years of experience with killers. And just that, what you said right there, it's just, it, it sends chills up my spine that this guy was laying in wait in that house at probably that time with the intention to do these children harm and, or these kids harm. I, I say children because, my God, 20, 21 years old is, a, is basically a child to me. And, and they didn't know he was there. They didn't know a predator was in the house with the intention to kill them. And that is just, it's very overwhelming because of all the things I've, I've watched and, and, and heard the conversations these guys have here about their victims, and that strikes me as just being so true. With this guy sitting there waiting. So I've heard guys in the world talk about that they were in the house waiting, and they heard the people talking. They heard him use the bathroom, and then they chose the exact moment to go in there and just strike. Well, another thing that came out in the affidavit that I thought was interesting was the survivor said she overheard a male voice say something to the effect, I'm going to help you. And she heard a girl crying. And there's only two males that it could have been, the offender or Ethan. And it's shocking either one, you know, if Ethan was trying to help his girlfriend, Zana, who was being fatally stabbed or, or what it was. I don't know who said that, um, but she did overhear that, and I think that's pretty chilling as well. Yeah, I think it, it, was, it was the perpetrator. Ethan, from what I've read and what I've seen, was found very near the door, so he hit him first, and then he entered the room. So maybe 
Ling and Wei woke up and she, the room is dark. She didn't, he tells her she's frightened. I'm going to help you. And then, of course, to him it was kind of a, a laughing or jokingly thing, like, yeah, I'm going to help you. I, that's, that's horrible to think about, but I would lay odds that that's what happened because Ethan was already uh, fatally wounded. Wow. All right, so there you have it. Um, we got Bill's thoughts on some things with the probable cause affidavit. Um, some things were good, knowledgeable things that I wanted to know about. The sheath being one of them, the exertion of energy. And it was kind of uh, taken back by his response to that. That is, no, that energy does not leave you. It does not dissipate. The adrenaline dump does not happen until you're at home and you're relaxed. You're in a comfortable environment. That's when it happens. So in his mind... No, the offender didn't see her, or he would have taken her out. Uh, that's what I got off of that conversation with Bill. Uh, he also felt, obviously, that the perpetrator was an idiot for taking his cell phone, you know, to the crime. You know, and I wanted to get into with him, and I just forgot, was, well... Is, did he do that because he is so stupid, or did he do it um, because it was something else? Granted, you know, the phone was turned off during the commission of the crime from what we see. But then why take the phone? If you have the foresight to turn it off, why even take it? It got me thinking, well, could this guy have gone in there and take video? photographs of the murder to relive it and had the phone on him. There's no indication that the phone, where it was, whether it was in his car or in his pocket, why take it at all? Just the thought that I had. Uh, so, hope you enjoyed that episode of uh, Redemption from Death Row. Some good insights from Bill. So, until next time, hey, Maine's out. Mm -hmm.